They were afraid of doing that. They were afraid of doing that. I just got a little message a little while ago from uh, Mook Nichols on my cell phone. It says, remind people that Mount Bari Lamont died 39 years ago today. Remind people that Ray Robinson was killed about two days before I left moving in with my uncle because I remember seeing him laying there outside of the structure in between the cement wall they had built in the house and moved to me. And I remember seeing him there, thinking, you know, uh, that that uh, this is this is what's going on down here. The first document I got, I'll pass this one out after the signature. It is a 302 that came from spiritual leader Matthew King of the Lakota Nation, who was in Wounded It reports that there are individuals buried at Wounded Knee are unmarked graves, so he reports it. The second report we find from the Wiggle Dock office, if someone can do this, and hand it up, we can make copies. I got copies up there in small order. The place is actually a report that went to Ramon Ramadou, Luke McKeesick, and Ken Tilson, and involved Bruce Ellis and that Wiggle Dock. <coughs> in which they're told by people down at Lumini that there's unmarked graves and fair people buried. And a delegation of people go down there to look for the site. They find a backpack in the woods. They found other stuff strewn around in the woods. Uh, they find blood and take a dirt sample. Send it, supposedly send it to California. So we've got people talking about people missing in Lumini. We've got Matthew King reporting that there are unnamed burials within the brand. Is there someone else that can pick this pile up? You pick it up and pass it up. This is out of the Wooden Dock uh, record from Ken Tilson. It was the other document that came about him having anime's wallet came out of it. Here's part of a narrative that Steve Hendricks got from an Iroquois woman from uh, about Wooden East here was talking. There were two publicized deaths, those of Frank Fairwater and Buddy Lamont, but there were also eight freshly dug graves found in the surrounding hills. Some of the people that were Indians that were dug up were identified as women who were raped and mutilated and killed, probably by dudes. All of this was quickly hushed up. So the goose squads, but the game never had that investigated and showed that the goose squads here freshly dug graves. So would someone else hand this up, please? As well. Sorry. We get to some better documents even here, which is interesting enough. Um, when we looked into these documents and reviewed these cases, we said that uh we pressed the Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We need to get into a summary real quickly here that I'd like to pass out. This is a cooperating witness with the case going cold. There are documents that individual witnesses and other people who feel that some of this stuff ought to be up, uh, getting out and have shared with them. In this case, this is a summary of a 2001 uh, conversation with Leonard Crowdog. It says right here, it says people are not buried under the trading post. He expresses the fear that the bodies will be found if somebody buys the property down here at Moody Day. And the individual says, what bodies? From when did he 1890? No, 1973. Leonard Kodov, if they pressure Clyde, Clyde, Clyde might say something. Kodov is also worried that Wallace Brat Blackout would tell. But he says, let's see if I can find a little quote here. I can't find it, but it's in here. It talks about Clyde again and, and Dennis being a lot. Sometime you talk with Dennis, they're the ones that are going to be guided in this whole thing. Okay, so this is a narrative of a conversation with Leonard Crowdog. He did a seven pipe ceremony one time to suppress the rest of the spirits that wounded me, if that tells you anything about what may be there. Here's an interesting document that's been given to me by a guy by the name of Cyril Chapman. It's this conversation with Bert Belcourt and Janice Denny, Wednesday, February 2014, 201, time 1650 location. Show these two Minneapolis airports. Janice brought up Dennis Banks and how badly she thought it had conducted the CDC interview with Bernie Degree. Banks comes out totally ridiculous, things unbelievable. Bird and Ramon, how banks put them in possible positions of having to back and justify situations because they were influenced by Neos and psychopaths by David Hill and Bell Gary. Blah, 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 blah. They raised the issue of rape. The black man, 
So it was basically a reactionary type of situation that took down there. I've had other people tell me that. That uh, Ray Robinson is killed in a reactionary kind of thing. Why the hell you gotta hide that? It's an accident. You know, why don't you go get his body? There's people down there that know where they are. Repatriation, repatriation is one might think. And we want this conversation. It's a transcript of a burned out where I say his brother ain't gonna show up. It's not even gonna show up. February 14th, 2001. You want to pass this round? That talks about Ray Robinson, it talks about who wanted to be killed. There was another set up that was born. Well, you are in You were in charge of security down there. Ask Carter Camp, he knows it. That's what it's up to. Uh, here's, a tele, here's, a, here's a document, a telephone interview that was on the phone. This is recorded. This is a transcription of this, if I can find the pertinent piece. Well, we were making coffee when they had these meetings, and I remember I put the pot in there, and I was giving them some coffee, and they were talking about how they killed this, this uh, man, this black man. Is that how they described him? Yeah, they just said they killed him. And then one of them said he was a black man. And I just was trying to, you know, I will tell you, they trusted me. I was there, so they knew I wasn't, you know, uh, well, they talked, and I remember them talking about it. So who do you remember being there? I remember Carter and Dennis Russ, Stan Holder, and Dave. Was Clyde there when you were serving Foster? I'm not really sure if he was or not. So there's a situation where maybe you weren't there. But there's other people that are uh, colored on this. I don't know. You'll have to ask uh, Bernie Lafferty about what the date was, okay? You want to pass this one out? Here's another document and testimony from a reported interview talking about Ray Robinson, talking about some of the other things. By the way, she confirms that Leonard Pelt there also uh, confessed to shooting the agents when they were out in California. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You get the other one passed out, okay? Okay, and then one last document here. Here's Carter Camp's quote. December 1970, Carter Camp team leadership. December 1973, after Camp shot Clyde Bellator, original transcript written from a handwritten jail that Richard LaForce transcribed. Me and Minnie Two's Richard LaForce, Yakima, said about a dozen other people who were originally in this. According to Bernie Lamfrey, Luke Nichols, several aim leaders attending a meeting at uh, Wickledot uh, office or household and wounded needs to discuss what to do with Robinson's body. Eventually, it's like if Chris Westerman takes the body out to bury it. There are several other bodies that Leonard Kodog indicated were victims of wounded in 1973. Other people who know the details of it. Alan Cooper, crazy Alan, got the rope of the pictures you saw earlier. Carter Camp, which is two of his fangs. Like a guy, like a person. 
You know, I've known Clyde for a long time. There are some things I respect about him. The drug dealing and the heart of survival school and other things. He's got to live it down. I got things to live down. You got stories to tell that are good, bad, and ugly, don't you? We all do. We all do. But it's time to bring the hopes about what has happened to an end. Luke Nichols said it took her 30 years looking at her daughters to grow up before she said, I started looking at my daughters and saying, you know what, i got to get over this fear. And they executed Anna because they, she thought she was an informer. It was a message to all of the women in AIM, including me and my sister. We better shut up or we might be the same fate. So for the last 28 years, there's times when I've played the game about Leonard Calder being an innocent man when he bragged to me about shooting Ron Williams at short range, you know. And Marlon Bratton Moore, a book, says they didn't even ask about it. Calder comes out and says, he's paid for his life and I shot the motherfucker anyway. And Kook says, why did you endanger my life by saying that? For the rest of my life, my life was endangered, my sister's life was endangered, and Anna Mae was executed within 30 days after that happened. I got the message of what she told me. And it took 30 years to grow up and understand and look at my daughters and say, what if someone killed my daughter? And all these guys inspired to just keep the truth from me. She says, that's why I decided to step forward. I have to do something for Anna Mae. I have to do something about the fact that I regret the game I played about Belzer being an innocent man because that's where I was at the time. You got people who want to tell the truth. You got people like Clyde who will stand here in the front row and try to intimidate us, get up and shower around. They got plenty of their own media. They've written their own books. There is some legitimacy in some of the things they've done. I, I looked up at him for a long time as courageous people. But he's a liar. And his brother manipulated things and always said that. Burton says it was all my it was all the time I had to protect my little brother. All the time I had to protect my little brother because that's why I got involved in this stuff. I have to protect Clyde, my little brother. My little brother. He didn't think of that. That's what I want to share with you. Take some time to look for the documents. Go into the vaults and look at them. Ask good questions and keep searching for the truth. But I would really ask on behalf of the people who were buried at Wounded East South Dakota from 1973, help bring them back home. If it's a forum where people are forgiven and given immunity or something, let's get this charade over and bring Harry Ray Robinson home. Bring the Sicilian guy that Leonard Crow talks, talks about being buried down there, and some of the other people that are there. Let's help bring them home in a good way so we can get on with all the good legacy that you guys did without this garbage, all right? And uh, I guess Cheryl wanted to have something to say. I'd like to see five minutes for her. <coughs> if there's a half a question, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.
the last week, the last few days of which my husband decided enough was enough and he went on a death fast. No food, no water. He lost his molars. Uh, Barbara Deming's arm was about this big around. Um, the last act of passive resistance that he made, he was unkind. They were taking him to force feed them in the hospital. And the last uh, act of resistance, he rolled off the stretcher and passed out. When they got into the hospital, they forced ice cold orange juice into his stomach that hadn't had food for all those days. He said it was the most painful thing he ever uh, experienced. That man was not an informer. Informers don't act like that. They don't have the commitment that my husband had. So I don't want to hear any smear of my husband. Ever. Because His life was the movement. The movement came before me, the movement came before his kids. The last I heard from him, he said, come with me to the wounded knee, because they had sent a, a speaker down to the conference that he was at, that he was at and they said, come to the wounded knee, we need reinforcements. And he said, I'm going to the wounded knee. This is the spark that will start this, the prairie fire. I said, no, it's not. I argued with him. I begged him. I pleaded with him, please, come back. We were growing food for the Black Panther Party in Alabama, outside Selma. It was time for spring planting. Please come home. No, you bring the kids, we'll go into wounded knee together. No, we won't. And that was the last that I talked with him. We were arguing. I regret it. All I ask is to have his body, wherever it is in the me, please let me know so that I can take it home and we can have a proper burial. Thank you.
As I recall, there were no informants when they first drove into the village. I don't remember this a long time ago, but I don't think they were. We did not know, the FBI did not know uh, what the villagers were going to do that night. We know that they had been up to Rapid City and forced them to take it over to the Mother's Butler Center there, or maybe more about cocktails. But exactly what the plans were, we didn't know. If we knew that they were going to be uh, taking over the village of Golden Team, believe me, the plans would have been handled a lot different. Uh, but they, been, they didn't actually send out some misinformation that made you think that they were going to go to the Because they knew they were performing so much. And that's why. Is that possible? Do you hear that? He said that he thought there was some misinformation put out about them going to party time and the rest of the party time. And that's why he that's why he that's why I don't know if you all anything said about party time. We did not know where they were going. I got another one. You know, they had a FBI guy to be called. I don't recall. I don't recall. This gentleman here has mentioned a couple of times. On my trials 30 years ago, FBI said, I do not recall. I do not recall putting the FBI. I'm just a moment. Anything else? I just want to ask Mr. Trimbach if he thinks the FBI was, was acting under the Constitution as, as a sworn law enforcement agency that you were acting fairly. I mean, this has come up time and time again today, so maybe you should be able to respond to that, that the FBI basically chose sides. This was J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. He's been recently passed away, but you were all part of that organization. And, uh, the question is, is were, were they acting constitutionally at that time? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, my Virginia reservation is an area of exclusive federal jurisdiction. The FBI investigates some serious crimes on that reservation. And the night of the takeover, there were serious crimes. There was arson, there was assault, and I only had a few agents that that's why we couldn't go in and make arrests. I'm not fitting our militants. So, yes, we were acting. Constitutionally, what we could have done, and sometimes I wish we would have done, just going home. Uh, that was not our job to uh, patrol an area or put down a riot, whatever you want to call it. But uh, no, they were acting totally within the law, and that agents there showed remarkable restraint and patience. They didn't want to be there, they didn't appreciate being shot at. And the, the first morning after the takeover, I went down there myself, unarmed, with a white flag to the main roadblock and said, we got to stop this. You were shooting at my agents when I find someone's going to be killed. Let's stop the shooting. That's what my primary agents for. Yes, we were definitely within the jurisdiction of the FBI. Yeah. One question. It's well known that the United States military was already there when people went to the deep.
And wasn't later the, an affidavit uh, produced um, over your signature actually requested that affidavit? Uh, well, you have to understand that there was a lot of activity going on, particularly the first two weeks. Uh, uh, shots being fired and a uh, uh, concern for the safety of my agents. Uh, one of the first things I did was ask the state of South Dakota to send us an average person health care to the tank is a weapon, tank is a weapon. And uh, there were many, many incidents that happened night after night. Also, not to this excuse of anything in particular, but the sister did not know everything that he was going to happen. I didn't go to bed except Monday night. I didn't go to bed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday was the first time I went to bed. So if I forgot a few things, uh, you'd have to understand why. I didn't have any particular uh, supervisors there to help me. I did get them later. Uh, but it was a very difficult time. And, uh, if I forgot something, I forgot something. I think that most anybody would forget everything that happened. So, no, I, and I explained all this in court as best I could. I stand by my testimony. Okay, the judge, did the judge admonish you and actually said that it was up to you to cover up and put out the papers? I don't really want to see you in my court anymore. Well, here, yeah, I have to that. Where Judge Nichols was coming from, he was solidly on the side of the defense as he was trying to back prior to that, before the trial. Um, and if he had, if he was fully convinced that I had done something illegal, I'm sure he would have taken action. Another thing I want to correct is that we want to be a peaceful occupation so that we could bring people like 10,000 Mr. Roberts and the other brothers that could come there.
more of white earth. Another is the last of our family's member. My blood tongue doesn't allow me to do that. There's a certificate that says I am part of the genealogy. Um,